Hello there, Alaskans, wherever you are. Welcome to the Must Read Alaska Show. Coming to you from somewhere in Alaska. This is the place where we talk about, you guessed it, Alaska. Where we keep the mainstream media on their toes and where we are standing up for what's right in a world run by leftists. You can find out more by heading over to mustreadalaska.com and also checking out the Must Read Alaska YouTube channel for some really great content. But first, let's get this party started. Welcome, everybody, to the Must Read Alaska show. I'm your host, John Quick, coming to you live from somewhere in Alaska. And we got a very special treat for you today. We have Governor Dunleavy on the Must Read Alaska show. Governor, welcome to the Must Read Alaska show. Hey, John, it's great to be on. Well, I'm super excited you're on. You know, something very tragic happened over this last Thanksgiving break, but we got to see Alaskans doing what Alaskans do and and throwing in their hands and their feet to help. Talk to me a little bit about this tragedy and what the response was like being there on the ground. Yeah, that's a great question. And it was, it was a sad event. Um, so in Wrangell, we had a, a uh, landslide, basically a mudslide. A lot of rain had occurred, which, uh, you know, preliminary um, analysis is that that weakened the, um, um, the, the trees, the, uh, the dirt, et cetera. And anyway, slid down uh, uh, side of the mountain down there at Wrangell and um, took out at least two homes. And in the process of taking out those homes, in one home, a family, a mother, a father, and three kids were um, unfortunately killed. Mm. And in another home, uh, the husband of uh, uh, one of the uh, individuals, a woman down in Wrangell, was also killed. And so we, um, and I want to give, uh, I want to give our Homeland Security and uh, uh, General Sachs with the National Guard a lot of credit because when these things happen and they happen a lot in Alaska, we're, we're, we're fortunate that oftentimes when these things do happen, people aren't killed. If you remember the earthquake back in 2018, 7.2, no one was killed and there were hardly any injuries. We were fortunate, but in this case, uh, a family was, um, unfortunately, uh, taken out as well as a husband of, a, a a very fine woman who I got to meet when I went down there. But you're right. These are the things that bring Alaskans together, uh, faster than anything uh people pull together there, there's no politics there's no there's no disagreement it's really how anyone and everyone can help and i saw that when i got on the ground and i have to commend wrangle to be honest with you um we um we asked them what they needed and they let us know that they would like to have some uh, uh geotechs go down there and take a look at the geological issues surrounding that slide as well as uh, potential other uh geological issues that uh, they were concerned about but I would say for the most part, the people of Wrangell, the organizations of Wrangell, the entities of Wrangell, the utility companies, uh, down in, a company down in Wrangell, you name it, all pull together, all work together. And um, I saw that in action. I saw that at meetings. I saw that when I went out to the landslide itself, had conversations with individuals working on removing the debris, had conversations with individuals that were there with uh, uh, stiffer dogs to try and locate some of the victims. Um, and other uh, other individuals in, in Wrangell. And so in the end, I mean, that's a tragedy like this, unfortunately, brings out, I think, the best in Alaskans. And it's unfortunate that um, people lost their lives in this. But uh, as we had said to the people of Wrangell, we're going to do everything we can to help them. And it's not just a one off, but uh, they'll continue to stay in contact with us. And anything they need, we're going to provide that for the people of Wrangell. That's awesome. So recently there was a, a uh, report that came out where Alaska is ranked number one in an education thing, and we're number one in the charter schools, which I think is just fascinating and phenomenal. Talk to me a little bit about that report and what that means to you. Yeah, so um, um, in grades four and eight nationwide, there's a, a, an assessment given called the NAEP test, National Assessment of Educational Progress. And um, it, all schools, all states are partake, partake in this test that's done uh, through the federal government. And for the first time, there was a research study set up by uh, some professors at Harvard, and they were able to take a look at the, the assessment scores around charter schools, because there's been a lot of talk about charter schools for many, many years. And what was really measured in charter schools up until this point were the imports, inputs, how much money goes into a charter school, how do you get a charter school chartered, uh, the parent groups, the uh, support groups, uh, what kind of teachers teach there. But there was really no research done on the outcomes. And so they, they did a study, and what they found was that Alaska, our charter schools, were number one in the nation in terms of those scores. 
And what was really fascinating for us is this included um, all kinds of charter schools in Alaska, charter schools in Anchorage, charter schools in Fairbanks in the Valley, but also charter schools in Bethel. We have a charter school in Bethel, a, um, a, a language charter school, a merchant school. All these schools did well. And we, it wasn't just by a point or two. The, uh, the state came in, that came in uh, in terms of a score second was Colorado. And Alaska bested the uh, state of Colorado, Colorado by 20-some points. <laughs> I love and it. so the professors in Harvard had a conversation with our commissioner of education on the phone because they really want to understand more of what's happening in Alaska and that uh, they don't believe this is a fluke. They actually believe that those charter schools are genuinely performing well for those kids. And so... Obviously, this is a conversation in the educational sphere in Alaska. It's going to be a conversation as we, uh, as we uh, go into the legislative session because why not capitalize on something that works? Why not, um, why not expand something that works well? And um, this is an example of that. And so, yeah, we're very happy for our charter schools. We're happy for our kids that are partaking in those charter schools. And we believe that this is a model that uh, deserves further discussion and hopefully some action this year in the legislature. Nice. Well, you're, you've been a governor who cares about a kid's education, which I think is awesome. I have three kids in the public school. Last year, you signed the Alaska Reads Act, as well as giving an opportunity for teachers to take part in a bonus program, which I think was funded to the tune of $60 million. Why has it been important for you that kids in Alaska get a good education? Uh, it's a fundamental, uh, it's really a constitutional right. And it's a fundamental obligation of all states uh, to be able to educate uh, their uh, their population and their kids. And so, as you mentioned, I mean, I've been a teacher, principal, superintendent, et cetera. And this is uh, this is near and dear to my heart. And we did we took a look at this because when I came up in night uh, came to Alaska in the early '80s, we were having turnover in our teachers back then. Uh, the year I came up, we had about 700 openings. And so, this has always been an issue for Alaska: how to recruit and how to retain teachers. Um, prior to me becoming a senator, I was um, the manager of the Alaska Statewide Mentor, uh, Teacher Mentor Project, which was a partnership with the University of Alaska and DED. And we were always trying to find out how and what can we do better to retain. And so when we're looking at all the research, the most important individual uh, uh, in a kid's education is that classroom teacher, in the classroom with those kids. So uh, based upon uh, research, based upon research that was done here in Alaska, and some of that research included having teachers give input, uh, what we found out was that um, uh, 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 compensation in one form or another may have an impact. So what we wanted to do was set up a three-year study, and this, this bill, if it's passed, would cover three years, in which we would take a look at if, if certain remuneration, um, certain certain amounts of money going to certain classes of, of classroom teachers in certain areas of the state, how that would impact recruitment and retention. So what this bill basically does, if you're an urban school district, a rail belt school district, every classroom teacher would get $5,000 a year to see how that would impact whether they stay and whether we could recruit more teachers. If you're a um, rural school district in many parts of the state, Teacher would be paid um, at the end of their uh, year ten thousand dollars mm. as part of this study uh, to see if this will retain teachers and if this will uh, uh, help us uh, recruit more teachers. And if you're in some of our more remote schools and school districts that are having a really hard time retaining and recruiting, an individual teacher would be paid fifteen thousand dollars wow. uh, per year for those three years. We believe it will have an impact. We believe it will answer the question because there's always this question whether pay matters. Uh, and, 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 the, and the question of and, and the question as to whether longevity in a school matters to kids, we believe it does. And so, we did introduce this bill. Unfortunately, it didn't get a lot of play last year. We're hoping that this changes this year. Um, yeah, I know a lot of people talk about the BSA, the base student allocation, but the bottom line is. Um, this would be significant amount of money, significant amounts of money in the pockets of classroom teachers, and that's the key. I was a teacher, but I was also an administrator. Administrators do good work, but the key to a kid's education is that classroom teacher. We're hoping this bill gets a uh, 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 play this year, and we're hoping this bill gets passed so we can set up the study. We think it's going to prove. Uh, uh, I think it's going to prove a couple uh, uh, theories and a hypothesis that folks have regarding recruitment and retention. I like that. So. But I 
there's a recent poll, I think, end of October. It gave you, I think you were the fifth most popular governor in the United States with a 63% approval rating. What, um, how is the dance with the federal government? Meaning there's, you know, you got to work with them, but you also got to push back with them. Where, where have you been able to find that sweet spot mixture of being able to still get things done with them, but also push back when it, when we need to push back? Yeah. So, I mean, it's been difficult with this administration right out of the get go. There's at least 54, 55 actions uh, that the federal government, I, I believe, have basically unleashed on Alaska. And, and a lot of it, it has to do with our resource development. There is this bizarre belief by the feds and some of their supporters, some of these NGOs and extreme environmentalist groups, that if we don't do anything in Alaska with regard to resource development, whether it's timber, whether it's oil, whether it's gas, that's a great thing. That, that's a positive thing. Quite the opposite is what I believe. And, and more importantly... Alaska's premise as a state was predicated upon its ability to develop its natural resources and uh, uh, make money from them to pay for government. We had too small of a population back in 1959 uh, for folks in the federal government to believe that Alaska could take care of itself through things like income tax or sales tax, and they were correct. We have tremendous, uh, we have tremendous resources. The country needs our resources. The world needs our resources. Um, but for reasons that make no sense at all, uh, a lot of the NGOs in this administration we have in Washington wants to shut Alaska down, whether it's oil, whether it's gas, whether it's timber, you name it. They don't, uh, even mining, they don't want us to develop our resources. And what I say to them is this, the world is still going to need these resources, so what are you going to do? You go overseas? You, do, you, do you do the development of these resources in countries that are dictatorships, that, uh, that uh, negatively impact their, uh, their uh, 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 indigenous folks or their minorities? Do they have child labor? Uh, how do they measure up uh, with regard to protecting the environment? In many cases, they're, they're 10 times worse than you could ever imagine. So we keep hammering this home. We, uh, you know, the legislature has uh, armed us up with funds to fight back so that Alaska's destiny can be fulfilled as a place where we could have jobs, we can have an economy, and we can have a future for our kids and grandkids. And quite frankly, they're wrong. This isn't just a, a disagreement over the flavor of ice cream. This is really about whether Alaska is going to be a going concern and be a state for the future or whether it's just going to be a rump state more, more along the lines of a national park. And so when folks attack Alaska and when Washington is wrong, uh, we're going to fight back, and that's what we're doing. I love it. Last question to you is this, Governor. Um, Cook and Let Gas, AGDC project, we've been hearing about this project for years and years and years and years. Is, do you have any new insight or updates that maybe folks maybe haven't heard about? Uh, talk to me a little bit about what's going on. Well, uh, AGDC, um, certainly we're talking about the large gas line from the North Slope. Yep. you got to remember, John, this is important. It wasn't until 2020 that we had all the permits for that project, all the federal permits, which is important. So it's really 2020 when things really start to move. We have interest from a number of different outfits throughout the world. Uh, the Japanese are looking at it. The Koreans are looking at it seriously. Um, had a meeting with the Jap- or excuse me, the Korean ambassador in Washington a few weeks ago. Uh, there's Wall Street investment houses that are looking at uh, ho- uh, ho- hoping to finance this large project. And there are different uh, different uh, other entities looking at the project. Everywhere, everyone from uh, LNG uh, uh, ships uh, carriers to carry the LNG to, to our markets in Asia. Um, those that would be involved in the pipeline building itself. Those that would be involved in the liquefaction of the uh, gas, a whole host of folks. I think we're closer today than we ever have been. The question is, you know, when will such a deal be inked? I don't have the answer to that, but I believe that the uh, situation in the world is really having a, a, a folks take a serious look at Alaska, and we're engaged in those meetings. So I'm hopeful something's going to come out of this. With regard to Cook Inlet, which is in the backyard of Anchorage and the Kenai and uh, obviously the Matsu, that gas has always been important. We pioneered LNG exports to Asia through Nikiski in 1969. And um, that gas, is, uh, those, those easy-to-access pools of gas uh, have, uh, have dried up, but there's still a tremendous amount of gas in the inlet. Uh, and this is, this is shared, this belief is shared by many. And so with companies such as Hillcorp uh, and, and Fury and others, we believe that uh, with a slight restructuring of the royalty payments that occur, even just the delay in the royalty payments, 
will allow some of these smaller operations to finance drilling in some of these pockets, which we believe will give us uh, enough gas to cover some gaps here for years to come. And hopefully that we have a bill and hopefully that bill will be uh, really scrutinized by the legislature this year. Hopefully some form of it will be passed that will help incentivize more exploration, more production in Cook Inlet. And this buys us a little bit of time to be able to put a uh, deal together for the uh, larger LNG line coming down from the slope. Nice. Well, Governor, do you have any last minute thoughts before we head off here? I want to be mindful of your time. Yeah, you know, I always I always think about, I mean, this is the greatest job in the world, being the governor of Alaska, and I want to thank the people of Alaska for that. But we're in the holiday season here in Alaska. You know, some people will say, well, it gets dark and cold in Alaska. I kind of think it's a time for uh, folks to spend time with their family, whether they do it here in the state of Alaska, which many do, or they take a trip with their families. But this is really the holiday season. I think we have a tremendous amount to be thankful for, grateful for. We live in a great state. Uh, we talked about how the people in Wrangell pull together. You see that all the time across Alaska, almost every day. There's, there's people helping people, neighbors helping neighbors. And I think that's what makes Alaska truly great. And I'll just end it by saying, John, I, I'm often asked by associates and friends throughout the country, why do I stay in Alaska? <laughs> they, and they'll say, it's a beautiful state. We know that. You've got great mountains, great vistas, all of this. And I said, you're right, but it's the people yeah. that make Alaska, Alaska. And so... I want to wish everyone a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year, and we got a lot of great things to look forward to. Awesome. Well, Governor, we wish you nothing but success here from Must Read Alaska. And for folks listening, watching, and reading, thanks for checking Must Read Alaska out. Until next time, I'm John Quick from somewhere in Alaska. Thanks, Governor. Thanks, John.